take a few deep in and out breaths. When you do that, you've proved a couple things right there. One is that you do have some control over the breathing. And when we talk about breathing here, it's not so much the air that comes in and out of the lungs. That doesn't come in and out on its own. There's a flow of energy in the body that brings it in and then expels it. And that's what you want to look at. Notice where you feel it as you breathe in, as you breathe out. And decide whether you like it. If you don't like deep breathing, you can try more shallow breathing, heavy, light, fast, slow, short, long. Experiment for a while to see what kind of breathing feels best right now. And in doing this, you help to anchor the mind in the present moment. Now we're here in the present moment. Not because it's a wonderful moment, because it's an important moment. And this is where you're shaping your life. Just as you can determine the way you breathe, there are lots of other things you determine in your life. You can determine what you think about. You can determine how you perceive things. You can actually change your feelings. In other words, feelings of pleasure and pain in the body. When you work with them with the breath, or you look at them in new ways, you find that pain can be less painful. Pleasure can be more pleasurable, if you're skilled. If you're not skilled, you can make the pains worse and destroy any potential for pleasure. This is an important principle. We're not only on the receiving end as we deal with the world. The mind can be very proactive, and we really do shape the way we experience things. This is why training the mind is so important. If the amount of pleasure or pain we felt in the world were entirely out of our hands, then there wouldn't be much point in training the mind. But we do shape things. You could sit here for an hour and make yourself miserable. You could sit here for an hour and just totally blissed out, just sitting here breathing in, breathing out. It's a skill. And as with any skill, it takes time and it takes your powers of observation and some ingenuity to figure out what kind of breathing feels best, what kind of what spot in the body is a good place to focus. Getting to know how you conceive the breathing process. In other words, when you have a mental picture of the breath, what's the mental picture you carry in mind? When the Buddha talks about how we shape our experience, he says there are basically three ways. One is simply through the way we breathe. You may have noticed this if you've had an injury. That breathing in certain ways aggravates the injury. In other ways, the breathing can help nourish it, soothe it. And it's a good skill to master, getting to know what kind of breathing is best for the body in different situations. That's one way we shape our experience. It's called bodily fabrication. Then there's verbal fabrication. It's basically how you talk to yourself. Years back we had a woman come in from Los Angeles and meditated with us a couple times, and then after a couple weeks she brought a friend. And at the end of the meditation the friend said, I've never suffered so much in my life, just sitting there breathing. We are under the trees out on the west side of the monastery. And the suffering was all in her thinking. All the things she was telling herself. The Buddha analyzes the way we talk to ourselves in terms of two terms. One is called directed thought. In other words, you pick up a topic, and then there's evaluation. You think about it, make comments on it, make, ask questions about it, make changes. And so when you're dealing with the breath, you're thinking about the breath and you're evaluating it. Again, the, the way you think sometimes depends on your picture of exactly what breathing is, what kinds of breath energy there can be in the body. This is where it's useful to open yourself up to many possibilities. There are many different levels of breath energy. There's the 
energy that brings the breath in and out of the lungs, or brings the air in and out of the lungs. There's energy that flows along the nerves, that flows through the blood vessels. And some of that energy moves in waves along with the in and out breath. And there are other types of energy that are not in coordination with the in and out breath. Some of them are very still, some of them move around. So there's a lot to explore here. It's best at the beginning to focus on what you experience easily, what's most obvious. But open your mind to the fact that there are other things going on in the breathing and the breath energy is a whole body process. In fact, some people even have a sense of breath energy that surrounds the body like a magnetic field. And they can work with it. So work with whatever you sense. And then evaluate it. This is what the, the working is. In other words, is the breath comfortable? What could you do to make it more comfortable? Pose those questions. Sometimes simply posing the question changes the way you breathe. Other times you have to experiment. When you get something good, how can you maintain it? And how can you make the most out of it? And John Lee talks about once there's a sense of ease and pleasure with the breathing, you allow it to spread through the body, down the spine, out the legs, down the shoulders through the arms, all through the head. You can think of the breath energy coming in and out, the eyes, the ears, and from the back of the neck down from the top of the head. There's lots of ways you can take advantage of whatever sense of ease and well-being come from the breathing and maximize it. Well, that's called verbal fabrication. And then there's mental fabrication, your perceptions and your feelings. As the Buddha points out, simply focusing on the breath changes the types of feelings you have in the body. Feelings are not so much emotions as they are just feelings of pleasure or pain, or neither pleasure nor pain. Sometimes when you focus on the breath, if you put too much pressure on it, okay, that creates a feeling of dis-ease. You get irritable. You feel confined. But if you learn how to hover around the breath, allow it to flow in a way that's comfortable. And tonight they use the word brakong, which is the word that you use for a when the parent is helping a child to walk, or the child's just beginning to walk. And you don't hold the child, because if you hold the child, the child is not going to get a sense of its own balance. But you've got your hands just a few inches away, just in case it falls. That's the kind of attitude you want to have to the breath, to give it a chance to show its stuff, to learn how to flow unimpeded through the body. So simply the way you focus on the breath, the way you pay attention to the breath, is going to create feelings. And you want to use that fact to create feelings of well-being. Then there are the perceptions, and these are like the metal labels you apply to things, or the pictures you use to depict things to yourself. In this instance, it's how you picture the breath, what way of picturing the breath, and where the breath can come in. where the breath goes out, how it flows through the body, which ways of picturing this are most beneficial, in other words, creating a sense of well-being and enabling the mind to settle down. So these are the raw materials with which we fashion our experience, and we get hands-on practice with them as we work with the breath. Because you find that these, once you get sensitive to the way you shape things in your life, You catch yourself doing it all the time. The way you talk with other people, the way you think about things, how you approach problems, simply how you sit around doing nothing. You're still shaping things in these three different ways. The way you breathe, the way you talk to yourself, and the perceptions and feelings that shape the mind. So the breathing training of the mind as you do this helps get you sensitive to the way you're doing this in the rest of your life. And then you can start thinking about, well, how do you want to shape your life? Or think about shaping your life as a big thing. How do you want to shape a particular activity? And 
And if you find that you're shaping it in an unskillful way, you can ask yourself, okay, which one of these three is the problem? How am I breathing when I think about it? Years back I was involved in a psych experiment where they were trying to get you to overcome fear. I thought about something that made you really afraid to do it. And then they had you break it down to steps that were things that were similar to that but not quite as quite as daunting. And then you had to visualize yourself doing those things. And as you visualized it, you tried to breathe calmly. And you could work yourself up step by step by step. And in my case, one of my big fears was playing the piano in front of people. And in practicing this way, I found that I could overcome that fear. It didn't make me a better piano player, but maybe a less self-conscious about other people hearing how my, my playing went. So what this means is sometimes just the way you breathe around a particular problem. If you notice that your breath is harsh, your breath is uncomfortable, stop for a second. Try to breathe through the tension the same way you're learning how to breathe through tension right here. Then you can ask yourself, how am I talking to myself about this. What are the terms I'm using? Is Could I look at it in a different way? This is where the ingenuity comes in. You want to look for good examples. If you know someone who's handled problems like this before, how did they handle it? How did they think about it? If you don't have any good examples you can draw on, well, try to think of what would be a good example for you to set for others thinking about a problem so you can work it your way through it. This, of course, gets connected to your perceptions. How do you perceive yourself? How do you perceive the other person? How do you perceive the problem itself and the possibility of a solution? When you learn how to break things down in this way, you find that you can get a lot more skillful at how you're shaping your own experience. And how you deal with difficulties as they come up. And we had that chant just now, aging, illness, and death. Those are the big ones. People sometimes complain, why is Buddhism so pessimistic? It talks about aging, illness, death, the unattractiveness of the body, suffering, suffering, suffering. Well, it's because the Buddha sees these as problems that can be solved, and so he tackles them head on. It's like a doctor who has the medicine to cure an illness. So, say, so suppose you can cure cancer. So, I'll ask you, okay, do you have cancer? Okay, if you do, we can deal with it. Doctors who can't cure cancer, they hedge around trying to find something else to talk about or to diagnose the symptoms as something else. But if you know you have the medicine that works against really difficult things, okay, then you're not afraid to talk about it. And you find that it's best to talk about these things so you can focus people on real problems in life. After all, we are growing older day by day by day. If you're still relatively young, you don't notice this because the body repairs itself every day. But as you get older, its self-repairing capacity gets less and less. And begin to see how the body just gets worn down all the time. And there's illness, and finally there's death. And the important thing is that we can experience these things and we don't have to suffer. The way we shape our understanding of these things can make a huge difference. We can be separated from people we love or things that we like. We can learn how not to suffer from that. It's all in how you shape things. And so as we meditate, we're getting practice in shaping things well, breaking things down into the different skills we have available to us, and then learning how to master those skills. So instead of shaping a lot of suffering for ourselves, we can learn how to shape a sense of well-being. I was listening to Someone talked the other day talking about how the basic Buddhist teaching is that to live is to suffer. And the Buddha never said that. There is suffering in life, but that's not all of life. There's an end to suffering in life as well. And if you don't go all the way to the end of suffering, there are many 
ways of finding relative well-being in life. But it all depends on how you shape things, how you think about things, how you perceive things, how you train your mind in the skills of breathing, in the skills of talking to yourself, and in the skills of perceiving and feeling things. A lot of these things we don't think of as skills, and that's why we don't get the advantage that can come from these processes. So this is why we train the mind. After all, there are things outside that are unpleasant and the things that are pleasant. And we have the ability to suffer from even the pleasant things if we don't handle them well. When the Buddha talks about suffering, he basically talks about two kinds. There's the inherent stress in things that arise and pass away and change. And that's just the way the world is. But there's also the suffering that comes from our own craving and ignorance, our ignorance in how to fashion things skillfully. Because we're so focused on what we want that we don't notice what we're doing. That kind of suffering, that kind of stress can be cured. And we do it through training the mind, by bringing awareness to the process of fabrication, how we shape our experience. It all happens right here. 